this is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast. I'm here once again with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, and we're recording at Nutmeg with our engineer, Frank Verderosa. Our guest this week is a five-time Emmy nominee and much-admired TV and film actress who's been working steadily since the mid-1950s. And she isn't ready to stop yet. Movies include Operation Petticoat, Some Came Running, Teacher's Pet, Airport, Grand Theft Auto, Colossus, The Forbin Project, Music Within, and The Evening Star, which she earned her Golden Globe nomination for Best Supporting Actress. You've also seen her in dozens of popular television shows, including Life with Father, Route 66, The Outer Limits, The Love Boat, Brooklyn Bridge, The Drew Carey Show, King of the Hill, That 70s Show, The New Adventures of Old Christine, and Gilmore Girls. But she'll forever be known as the wise and supporting matriarch. Supportive. (laughs) (laughs) Supportive. Best supporting matriarch. (laughs) Marion Cunningham on Gary Marshall's iconic series, Happy Days. (laughs) In a career spanning seven decades, she shared the big and small screen with Ginger Rogers, Tony Curtis, Lauren Bacall, Noel Coward, Frank Sinatra, Cary Grant, Lee Marvin, and Shirley MacLaine, as well as former podcast guest Ed Asner, James Caron, Bernie Capel, and of course our pals, Donnie Most and Henry Winkler. Her new memoir is called My Days, Happy and Otherwise. And we couldn't be happier that she decided to schlep to the studio and speak with us. Please welcome to the podcast a talented versatile performer and a woman who once gave Clark Gable a love note written on an Easter egg. (laughs) Mrs. C herself, Marion Ross. Oh, I have never been introduced so gloriously. (laughs) Fabulous. Fabulous. Of course, now now I have nothing to say. <laughs> well, you've you've done a lot, Marion. Well, thank you, darling. I have, but because I am now, I am. I I, I forget. I'm I'm eighty nine. Is that that? Isn't Bless that your something? heart. Bless your heart. Isn't that something? My goodness. But and and uh, pretty well, pretty fit. So any day now, it could be over, but I'm I'm, uh... You look great to us. We should tell our listeners that we're looking at you. This is obviously an audio-only podcast, but we have a Skype hookup with L.A., and you look wonderful to us. Oh, thank you, darling. Thank you. We're we're looking at Mrs. C. Mrs. C? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) E! Well, I tell you, it was an extraordinary time because uh, when I meet... Children who are now in their 50s, you know, there's total recognition. Everything is fine. Then there's another bunch that say, uh, uh, no, they they don't connect. And then when they find out that I am SpongeBob SquarePants grandma's oh, yeah. voice, <gasps> oh, 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 they start to shake. They show me their funny looking underwear, you know, and they're <laughs> just all really great. <laughs> Do you find I, that kids, that, that, that because the show is always on somewhere. Yes. Do you find that, that, that kids are watching it? Young kids? Are, are, no, they watch SpongeBob. They watch SpongeBob, but, not, but they yeah. don't know you from Happy Days. And not, they really don't, mm-hmm. no. And because Happy Days was shown all over the world. 
Yeah, We, and still uh, you is. You know where it was really a big hit was Italy. Italy, they loved it because of the Fonz. Arthur Fonzarelli. <laughs> and the Fonz is very famous there. And I've been there several times to be honored, and it's it's really ador- adorable. You can find a little old man handling all those suitcases and something by a pier in Venice, and he is. I hear him humming to himself, "Don don don don, happy days, don 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 don, happy days." <laughs> Didn't say a word to me, but I thought, well, very it's cute. You know, I was we were watching. We have so many questions that we can ask you, Marion, about Happy Days. But I was showing Dara, uh, Gilbert and his wife Dara uh, the wonderful uh, bloopers of you well, of, of Henry. That was we spent most of our time making the bloopers. You know that, yeah, you know, yeah. Because it was it was children at play. We got the show done, but most of the time was spent uh, playing with you know making up stuff. Yeah, there's a great clip. It's online on YouTube of Henry chasing. You spray him with whipped cream in the kitchen. Then he chases you across the set, spraying you with whipped cream. But what really stood out for us (laughs) is a great little bit that the two of you worked out where you and Tom Bosley and Ron Howard and Aaron Moran, you're all in a scene in the living room and you're acting out the scene. But you're, do you remember this? You're taking. you're taking the moments fa- to make out with the Fonz? The Fonz, the Fonz <laughs> is helping me on with my coat. And just and, and, and he would reach around and kiss me on the mouth. Then he would help me with my coat a little more and then kiss me again. And Tom, <laughs> now we had a live audience out there. Tom would just freeze. You know, I could see him getting so mad, getting so mad at me. So, oh, so we have a wonderful, f- you know, footage of that, you know. And Until the audience got really nervous, and then we had to stop. <laughs> oh, really? They would get uncomfortable? <laughs> yes, they did. Yeah, they froze. There's they also a clip froze. of you coming down the stairs from Fonzie's yeah. apartment. Fastening your dress. <laughs> yes. <laughs> putting, your, putting yourself back together, as it were. Oh, I tell you, it was, it was children at play. It really was. And you know, we also had a softball team. Yes. And we played... I mean, a very serious softball team. I had a uniform. I had my own bat, you know, and my shoes and my mitt. And I played Rover. And we played softball in front of the media guys in ball fields all over the United States. And then one time we went over to Germany and played for the U.S. infantry uh, in, in Germany on this space up up in Gebelstadt or something. And it was fantastic because here we would meet these troops. We have all this ba- battle makeup on. They were all lined up to do maneuvers. Here comes the whole cast of Happy Days in our red baseball suits down the thing. And these boys are, are not supposed to break rank at all. And here we come. And can you believe a wonderful? We've had wonderful experiences, and then we went to Okinawa and we played softball in Okinawa with the U.S. Marines. Wow, unbelievable! Yeah, and and we'll talk more about Happy Days later. But whenever someone's worked with Gary Marshall, I always want them to do their Gary Marshall imitation. Yes, I, I had what Gary would do. He would send me flowers. If I did something good in playing ball, you know, he, uh, and, and I had a collection of these cards, I should have brought one. You were wonderful. You hit great, he says. You hit great. <laughs> you brought, and coming around the base with your red hair flying, you were great, you know. So <laughs> I had a collection of these because he would send me a big bouquet of flowers and a lovely card. So... <laughs> It was, uh, uh, how many people, and I was, I was 50, 55 years old. I would say to my neighbors, oh, I'm sorry, I can't go to lunch. I, I, I have to go to baseball practice right now. <laughs> <laughs> he pays you such a nice compliment in the book, uh, Mary, because, yeah. you know, we, Gilbert and I talk about how Hector Elizondo turns up in every Gary Marshall movie. Yeah, yeah. And, he's, and I, well, I always thought it was because he was a good luck charm. Yeah, some, that's some kind what of talisman. I thought. But he said that he needed somebody sane and somebody calm and somebody <laughs> reasonable and rational on every set that he could go to with yes. his problems. And so that's why Hector Elizondo, and he said you were that on Happy Days. I, I was. You were his Hector I was, Elizondo. I was like the mother, you know, and uh, so and Tom Bosley was feisty little guy, you know, so he's a little more feisty. But I was a calming influence because what mothers are. Boy, we had we had an awful lot of fun, 
and by adding baseball to that, it brought mm-hmm. us together, kept us together. We would travel together on the buses. Well, like when we went up to play San Francisco before the San Francisco game, um, we, we all went to a restaurant, and the, Henry pretended that the, the, this was a mafia place. So he comes <laughs> out of the men's room and, 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 and you know, machine gun all of us down and, and uh, other guests who were there just had to kind of put up with it. But we played and we, nobody would start any one of these dinners until the whole company was there. It would wait. They'd wait for you. you That's know, nice. Come on, come on you're late. We're waiting for you. <laughs> it's nice to like your coworkers, isn't it? If you're going to work for them for that, work with them for that long a period of time. Well, we did become a family. I can remember sitting backstage one time, and we've got to wait about ten minutes before the before we really start. But they've assembled us all. They were sitting, so we're telling stories. And Tom is saying, you know, he's saying, you know, your mother something. And I said, Tom. I'm not their mother. You know, by that time, we had completely forgotten. You had to remind them. <laughs> I wasn't, yes. We'll, we'll come back to happy days like Gilbert said, but I was telling uh, I was telling Gilbert and Dara about your days as a contract player, uh, which which is fascinating. It's a fascinating part of the book. I mean, oh, we could yes. go we could go way back to Minnesota, and we will, and we will too do that in a bit, but the, the, now, da- the it, day's on the lot. Explain to us what a contract player is. But people who don't know well, what that I, was back then. They would have a young talent department and they would sign up young people that they thought they were going to be comers and you got paid $150 a week. Well, I had been making $30 a week at Bullock's filing <sighs> pieces of paper, filing sales slips. So now I got $150 a week. And I remember that my agent... It's a long story, but anyway, he's now he's taking me. Now, now he said, now we will try Paramount. We're going to Paramount. And apparently I said to him as we went through the big DeMille gate, well, this will be just as good. <laughs> <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't a clue that you couldn't do this. <laughs> well, you, you were twenty. You were twenty-four. Do I have that right, Marion? When you no, got the contract? No, but I was. I was twenty-two when I first went there because I was oh, a you, college graduate. Right, right, right. And, and what's interesting to me is that uh, I was very connected to the Globe Theater in San Diego. So Craig Noel uh, called up the Pasadena Playhouse and uh, got me into a play called Journey to Jerusalem by Maxwell Anderson, and I played the Virgin Mary, which was perfect for me. So, and, and, and the boy Jesus, the 12-year-old boy Jesus, was played by Sylvie Drake, who was who became the drama critic in the L.A. Times. Wow. So, so, so we go back, you know, all, all those 70 years, and... The, and they, my agent sent a talent scout out to see the play. And I think they both went to the same temple. I think somebody owed somebody a, a favor. So the next thing I know, I'm coming into the studio to audition for a contract at Paramount. Oh, that's how you got the screen test. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a fascinating and when, journey. And when, I did, and when I did the screen test, one of the grips... And I'd worked so hard on the screen test. Came up to me with his greasy little hand and he shook my hand and he said, you should thank your mother. Wow. Now to me, that rings, that is profound. I was so different from all those other girls, you know? I don't know. And of course, we jump all over the place. Before you came to L.A., and when you were a little girl, when did you first get the acting bug? When I was about 13, 14, I would go in the library, plus loving the movies, of course, but uh, and read, who, at first I would read Who's Who of Famous People. It's a big book, <laughs> Who's Who of Famous People. And they're, and they're born and blah, 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 and then they're famous. And, and you think, well, oh, then what happened? What happened in there? And they're, they're, so I remember reading Noel Coward's uh, autobiography. Mm-hmm. Present Indicative was the name of it. So 
he was like nine when he was starting. And I'm like 13 and, and, you know, I'm not getting anywhere. So what I love is that take me back, go, take me to 25 years old. Now I am at CBS in Blythe Spirit with Sir Noel Coward. And I'm playing Edith the Cockney Maid with Claudette Colbert, Lauren Bacall, Mildred Natwick. I, I, and isn't that something? It's mind blowing. It yeah, shows it, you determination. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, it's, with it. It it's also reminds me of the Shirley Temple story in the book too. Tell tell Gilbert that, because that's well, another one of those stories where it kind of comes full circle. So I'm doing the Hollywood. We're doing the, the Rose Bowl parade. All the TV moms, and the uh, the Grand Marshal of the parade that year was Shirley Temple, and I, apparently she'd done it several times before. So. I thought Shirley Temple. Well, so I, 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 I was so wanted to meet her, and uh, so I, we were all in this big mansion waiting for the parade to start, and 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 early, early in the morning, and I go up to her, and my, I've got my arms spread out because I wanted to hug her, you know, <laughs> and she said, "Don't mess me up." <laughs> so. so <laughs> I step back now like I'm practically crying because I thought, so, oh, so that's all in the book. Isn't that fun? Well, the, to the, be shut down by Shirley Temple. <laughs> yeah, well, the, I know. And then, and then I, so before the morning was over, the next hour was over, my press agent, Dale Olson, was over there talking to Shirley Temple. And Shirley Temple said, is that that mother from Happy Days? I think, I mean, my God, she knew who I was. Is that that mother? And uh, Dale said yes, and she started to sing, dun, 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 happy days. And he said, don't you do that, or I'll start to sing the good ship lollipop. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what I was referring to, Marion, specifically was in the book that you had a Shirley Temple doll as a kid that you loved. We, we did. We did. My my. my Sister had a bad case of the flu, and my father, I don't know how, how old I was, I'm very, very young, four maybe. My father went to the drugstore, and they had a contest. And the contest was for a 22-inch Shirley Temple doll oh, in her beautiful dress and her curls and everything. And you had to buy a key, and you could open a lock, and you could win this doll. My father bought one jar of Vicks Vapor Rub, you know. <laughs> <laughs> by God, the, the key opened the lock, and we had that Charlie Shirley Temple doll oh, for for years and years. Yeah, I I love the part in the book where you say, "Well, you actually get to meet her," yes. and you, and and you you flash back to your father, and you thought, oh, "What what what he think, what he must have what he would well, have thought." For me to finally get to meet Shirley Temple, and well, I felt the same way. I was just turned to jelly. Yeah, it's kind of the magic of show business. Yeah, and it's it's like the Noel Coward story because these are these are mythical people to you as a child. Well, and you know when the when when the whole big live TV show was over, uh, Noel Coward said, "Marion, would you like to come to a little sit down supper at, at uh, Lauren Bacall's house, so Humphrey Bogart's house?" So I don't know. Well, okay, so we all and by that time he was uh, Noel Coward was having a fight with Claudette. So she didn't come to the party. And Lauren Bacall couldn't come to the party because Bogey was very sick. So I got to sit with Clifton Webb, Noel Coward, me, and Mildred Natwick. And cool. Porter would say to Clifton, tell that wonderful story about when you you and the Lunts were doing such and so. I thought I, thought I died and went to heaven. Yeah. yeah. So did did you spend any time with Bogart? Not a very little. But when I came in, he was playing with his children in the ent entry room and saying, I'm so glad I don't have to read today because we were going to all read the script at their house. Yeah. And uh, like, like he would have been nervous to do that. But he was just busy playing with his children. Were you still, were you, were you having those moments like, I can't believe I'm this kid from Minnesota that used to look these people up in the library and I'm ringing the doorbell and Humphrey Bogart's answering the door? I did, but I, 
I got a chair. First of all, the butler said, what do you want to drink? <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, like I knew, I said, scotch and water. You know, it's like a... Anyway. <laughs> I got... Once I got the lay of the land, I thought, even though I played the maid, you know, I got a, a little chair and sat right down at Noel Coward's knee so that I could uh, eye to eye with him when we read the script, you know. I, mean, I couldn't believe it. And uh, that's you, some, something. You liked Lauren Bacall, but you didn't was, But you didn't care so much for Claudette Colbert. Fair to say? She, you really read the book. You really read the book. <laughs> I, look, I look for the dirt, Marion. I look for the dirt. <laughs> I know. I have no dirt in my life. There was a I, little. A little bit. Very little. Yeah. You know? But uh, uh, Lauren Bacall was a real babe, and she was thrilled to be working with Noel Coward, and she still was a young enough actress. She's only about two or three years older than I was at the time, mm -hmm. married to Bogey, and had two little kids even. So, my God, it's amazing. So, Claudette had known Noel Coward for years and years and years and years. So, what, what Claudette would do is we would just get rehearsing well. And, of course, he wrote it. He knew it. He, it would come tripping out of him so fast. And she would carry a few pages, you know, and a scarf and, and drop either the scarf or one of the pages and also have uh, just to interrupt all the time and also have questions to ask. So just as we got flowing, that would be a, one of those interruptions. So that finally, it just took a week, a week of this. You're doing a live television show. So everybody is so cooperative. And professional until till Noel Card finally said, Claudette, shut your fucking face. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll have to bleep that. You'll, you'll no, have we to bleep that. The, la the, language, the language is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we allow that language on the show, Marion. Yeah. So from then on, I stayed away from her as much as I could. <laughs> <laughs> And all she said was, shut my fucking face. Shut my fucking face. <laughs> was it shocking to hear that coming out of Noel Coward? Well, it, it, it was, all I know is that it was war with them from then on. Uh -huh. So it was war. Uh -huh. yeah. And what was the Clark Gable love note? Oh, uh, you, you guys have really read the book. I... I was in Teacher's Pet with Doris Day. Oh, yeah. Clark we know that movie well. <laughs> I don't know how you do, but uh, George Seaton was a friend of mine somehow through the business. And so I got cast as that. And it was Easter time. So I got colored an egg and wrote on their MR loves CG. <laughs> <You know? laughs> No, it's sad. I was probably 25, 26 years old. My God, pretty. But uh, he was just such a giant, such a giant talent. So I, and then I was afraid to give it to him. So I gave it, he had an assistant called Alabam. Alabam was this <laughs> great guy that fronted him, you know. So I would give it to Alabam to give the egg to Clark Gable. <laughs> oh, so... Oh, so then he he made a little circle, like he got the egg, and you know, right on, liked it. But uh, oh, he gave you a, he gave you the approval. Yeah, but I have a wonderful picture with him. You know, you know. That's nice. I found it interesting. So it'll that, be in the book. It'll be in the book. Yeah. I found it interesting that William Holden did nothing for you. You worked with William Holden, and isn't, you respected him as an actor, but you didn't get a movie star vibe the way you did from Gable. No, isn't that interesting? Yeah. No, it's like, it's interesting to see who has sex appeal and, and who doesn't. He, God, he, he has sex appeal, I guess, but, I, but not for me so much. Interesting. No. Interesting. Now, yeah. I, Gil, Gilbert and I are fascinated by the, by the studio, uh, the contract player days. Can we go back to that? Yes. Because I was, was now you would show up for work every day. You'd get your hair and makeup. E was Edith Head dressing you? Yes. What was she yes. like? Another uh, legend. She, she's absolutely, and she would say, "You know, one of your shoulders a little low." Okay. I mean, <laughs> you have to be perfect. So they put a little pad in the shoulder, and then then she would say, "Now your your legs 
Okay, here with the legs. Uh, I th- try to wear the highest heels you can possibly stand because that will make your legs look better. Okay, and uh, so most of us girls did in those days. Who who was in the golden circle? Tell Gilbert because this is interesting. Uh, Barbara too. Rush was Barbara in the Rush, golden circle. Who's still with us? Uh huh. Yeah, and uh, lots of them have passed on through. Carolyn you know? Jones. Carolyn Jones was. Yeah. And also a little girl named Catherine Grandstaff. And she came up from Texas and she, she was so interesting. She was a little beauty queen or something. And, but she, when she talked to you, she would stand so close, so close to you. You know, she was like, wait. A close talker. Well, how unusual. Anyway, she ended up, guess who? She ended up snapping up. Uh, uh, Bing Crosby. She became Bing Crosby's young wife. You remember the last oh, wife? Oh my God, Catherine yes. Crosby. Right. Yeah. Yes. But she was a starlet. She started and out. That as... was Catherine Grandstaff. So yeah. Catherine Crosby. So yeah. they're paying you one hundred and fifty dollars a week. You show up uh-huh. for work every day. Uh-huh. You Edith Head do- is 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 dressing you, and you're getting your hair done. But and, you're but you're and, and you're you're basically in the system. You're on the lot. You're part of show business, and yet you're feeling inadequate well, you're feeling no, like you don't you belong have no you have no function you, or, you you have nothing to do you have no function you have, can have lunch try to think of something interesting to say at lunch you know here's marlene dietrich comes swooshing into the into the lunch room you know and here's james mason over there and um, here's cb demille around the corner in this little alcove i mean uh, this was a really wonderful dining room and it wasn't just for the hoi polloi. It was for the really big stars. And we were there. We had our own circle, uh, the golden circle table right in the middle of the room. And our pictures were up on the wall with all, of, all the other big stars. Wow. But, but you, you, really? you started to feel like you didn't fit. Like you, well, and there's that Audrey were, Hepburn story, too, in the book where you saw her under the hairdryer and you compared yourself to her because yes. you were similar ages. Exactly. I, we were just about the same age, and I, under the hair hair dryer next to me, there's just two of us up there. This girl stands up and up and up and up. That's because she was very tall and gracious, charming. You want to die? She was so wonderful, and I went right out and bought two candy bars and ate them right away. <laughs> 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 but a lot of people also had the opposite view with the studio system of like, oh my God, I can't believe I, I'm i employed by a studio every single day. It's very unusual. It's it's I, I don't know that they do that anymore. They, they would sign up a bunch of young talent. Apparently, that was not very much money. So uh, hoping that one of us had hit and become a star. But, but I, the first, I was, the only picture I was in was called Forever Female with Ginger Rogers, William Holden, Paul Douglas, uh, Jesse Jesse White. Jesse White. And, that's, a, and, that's a name yeah. we respond to on this show, Marion. I know. Jesse White. <laughs> and How about James I, Gleason? He's in that. Wow. And Jimmy Gleason. And yeah. Jimmy Gleason. Jimmy all Gleason. These people. We love him. So it was it was thrilling to be in this. And the director, Irving Rapper, uh, I, I am playing. They went to New York and got a girl who was about my age, but from New York. And that was Pat Crowley. And they got Pat Crowley to do the lead. I got to play her friend. I get to be the friend. So we, so the director would say to me, uh, he thought I looked like Greer Garson. So he said, Miss oh. Garson, what do you think about that? You know, what, what we were doing. Uh, well, I'm a college graduate, you know, so I would have opinions. You know, about the script. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else interjected with opinions. And then the ne- next day, the Irving Rapper would say, and, and Miss Garson, what do you think about that? So I would have some more <laughs> opinions. <laughs> it took a little while. I'm slow. I'm so slow to get th- to realize that he was making fun of me. 
you know. But he respected you because you spoke out. You, you, you. Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, can you remember anything about Jimmy Gleason and Jesse White? Well, Do they just were awfully funny, awfully funny and wonderful. Yeah, and and Jesse White was very easy to talk to and very much fun. They were fun. It was it was a I must say that was Hollywood the way you want want to see Hollywood. And most of the scenes that I was in mostly was shooting it we made we made Sardis. We we designed Sardis restaurant in New York. So I was in that big scene and uh it just was er, er. and it was wonderful to watch Ginger Rogers too because she was dating a very handsome young man probably 20 years younger than she was. So that was all kind of fun to see th that whole business going on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to read in the book, Mary, and which people, which stars kind of gave you the cold shoulder. Like you said, Deborah Carr just straight out ignored you. Yeah, she had nothing. Well, she didn't have any reason to. Because when I, I was going to be in this picture, once again, it was George Seaton. Uh, um, I forgot the name of the, movie the proud and the profane Proud and the profane yeah and so uh, we're going to go on location all the way and i flew all by myself with mr semplendurfer the grounds the tree man he moved trees around mr semplendurfer and i threw took for days to get all the way to like miami and then we got another plane to fly to the virgin islands so by the time we got there it was two or three in the morning. And uh, when I got off the plane, the press agent from Paramount who was there, pretty drunk he was, pretty drunk. And he thought I was Deborah Carr. So I'm so polite and well brought up that by the, he gave me a big orchid in a cellophane box and a big hat, a big sombrero. And, th and by the time I could get... Uh, 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 I didn't want to embarrass him, but by the time I could get anything out, I am whooshed into a big limousine, and I'm pfft, I'm on my way to the Caribe Hilton Hotel, <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, I there was nobody but me in the. So I thought, well, I I should tell somebody. I should really speak to somebody about this. But so, but the next thing I know, we're at the beautiful hotel. They take me upstairs to this huge suite and open it electronically. The curtains open up. The sea is all lit up down below with rocks all lit up. It was fantastic. And then the phone rings. <laughs> the phone rings. It's terrible. Terrible. There's been a terrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> So they said, they said, but you can stay here. I said, no. I said, where's Mr. Semplender for staying? I'd rather stay where he's staying. Yes, he's in another hotel. So I got the hell out of there fast, fast, because I didn't want to be running into her in the hall. That's a fun story. <laughs> you know, I never met anybody who knew George Seaton, who's one of my favorite directors. He oh, made Miracle, on, lovely, Miracle on 34th Street. Oh, what a lovely man. Wonderful man. And put his own money into that movie, too, which is an interesting story. What was your experience of Thelma Ritter since you worked with her several times? And she's somebody who comes up on the oh, show. Oh, yes. I, I, I didn't have any dealings with her, but what a heck of an actress. Heck, so no, I have no story to tell. Mm -hmm. And you worked on uh, Operation Petticoat with Tony Curtis and Cary Grant. Yes. What was that like? Oh, oh. <laughs> and Blake you. Edwards. I, I know. It was extraordinary. And so we went all the way to Key West, Florida. And one afternoon, Tony was arranging a party, and I got invited to this party. And he has a whole big yacht, huge big yacht. And he comes out on the deck, and he's got his captain's hat on and his full <laughs> uniform. He is, he is really living it up. And Okay, so we all go, a bunch of us, not everybody, not everybody, but uh, we were all U.S., we were Navy nurses, so there weren't so many of us. So we all went on this, on this trip. When we get out into the Caribbean, it was so choppy and so awful, even though we've all waved, you know, gaily to the crowd on the dock out there in the ocean, we all got seasick just like almost immediately, and there was a huge 
banquet just go to waste. So we spent the night on the ship. The next morning we all woke up and everybody played poker and it was great. And Janet Lee was there too. And it was, I really felt kind of strange and out of it, not too hip. I never didn't, I never felt very hip in the midst of all these things. But, and then one, uh, I, I, I was working on this picture and I, didn't have my period. So I think, I'm thinking, I, I think I could be, I think maybe I'm pregnant, you know. And I, and I thought, uh, they said, now you're going to have to go down in this submarine. I thought, I don't think, I don't think I should go down in that submarine because maybe, maybe, you know, when it happened, anything happened to the that I'm pregnant. So one morning I'm sitting up on the top of the conning tower of this submarine it par- parked by the, you know, pier, the edge. And Coney, Tony, or Coney, Cary Grant was, that was down there and he came up and sat down beside me and I said, I don't think I should go down in the submarine because I've, I'm going to have a baby. Oh, he said, you are, you are. He started to cry. (laughs) And this was before he ever had a child. And now he has Jennifer, his daughter, Jennifer. Sure. So I've I've had these wonderful experiences. You made Cary Grant cry. Wow. I did. That's a cool thing. (laughs) You know, I have to ask you, Marion, all these credits, and this is interesting because a lot of these are uncredited roles. You're in Lust for Life with Kirk Douglas. Yeah. You're in Around the World in 80 Days with David Niven. Do you, do you do you remember these experiences and did you interact with these people much or, or as a as a bit player were you kind well, of with with Kirk Douglas I I was a nun at the very end of the movie when he goes to Arles. I remember the scene. And I'm in full nun's outfit and it's all pressed against your ears and when you have that full habit on you're like if you're in a tunnel and you can hear your own voice inside and Vincenti Minnelli would talk to me and he'd talk to me so close and he would like mesmerize me and and get and then put me into the scene and uh, it was wonderful I was like (laughs) I was this nun it was it was wonderful so later I thought I, I could see in the trades that Kirk Douglas was m- uh, going to make a movie called Lizzie with Eleanor Parker. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, I'll write him a letter and say, I would like to meet you out of my habit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I got a phone call right away. <laughs> now, uh, I was so shy when I was there that he had nothing to say to me. I had nothing to say to him. So it was like... Hilarious. Oh, uh, was so sad. But he gave me a part in the picture anyway. No, he gave me a part. <laughs> you're, you're also in a movie called The Secret of the Incas with Charlton Heston. Do any of these ring a bell? Uh, yes, yes, because... Uh, oh, Charlton Heston. So I, I somehow either I, I had a very small part. It was not important, but somehow I got to be kissed by Charlton Heston, and it was it's been burned onto my lips ever since. Oh, that's great! Know, isn't that something? That's a great story. <laughs> what about Walter Brennan? You made a movie called God Is My Partner. Oh, I did. What a what a complicated, wonderful. Old man, he was wonderful. Yeah, I played a lawyer. Yeah, yeah. terrific and actor. Well, Walter that's fabulous. Walter Brennan and, and Tightwad had every penny ever made. Really? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that interesting? That, that, that yeah. sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and what what part? What which episode of The Outer Limits? Do you have oh, a memory yeah. of that? Oh, you did so I much do, television. I do because I I was. Uh, uh, Richard Nye, who used to be married to Greer Garson, wow, very briefly, was in it, and he played a man who had gills, actual gills on his neck. So he was a, a sort of a aquatic uh, throwback of some kind. So it was weird. And McDonald Carey was in it. You know, oh These sure, were good shows. McDonald Carey shows. Yeah, 
Good shows. Do you remember I, making the big circus with Victor Mature and Red Buttons? I don't think I was in that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cross that out. Okay. My information is bad. How about Some yeah. Came Running with Frank and Dino and, and Shirley MacLaine, who you would go on to work with so memorably? Yes. In, uh, yes. Well, so, uh, Evening Star. Uh, See, I'd already worked for Vincent Di Manelli mm -hmm. on, on Lust for Life. So mm -hmm. now, uh, once again, they needed a nun. So now I'm a nun again. <laughs> so look, you specialized in playing nuns. And, and mothers. And <laughs> so I go in, and the one scene, Dean Martin is sitting up in the in the hospital with his cowboy hat on or something, and uh, I'm he's teaching the nun how to play poker. So he's teaching me to play poker. Well, then Frank Sinatra comes in. He's not even in the scene. And he comes in the scene and he said to Dean Martin, oh, great. I've never met a nun before. This is great. So <laughs> I, I, was, I was so flustered by them that I just got out of there fast, you know. <laughs> the, Gilbert, Gilbert brings up um, um, Outer Limits. You did so much television, so much great television. I mean, Zane Grey Theater and Thriller, Karloff Show. Oh, geez. The, the Fugitive yeah, um, I think Ed, I think Ed Platt was in that uh, Outer Limits episode, by the way. Route 66, Rawhide, The yeah. Detectives, Felony yeah. Squad, The Untouchables. Anything anything stand out? All of them. All of them are good. All of them are good. Yeah. Because a lot of them were... And I was a character actress, and they mm -hmm. were all very good character roles. Very good character roles. And you go on location, you know? So... Do you remember... Go ahead. Very serious. I was a very serious actress until Happy Days came along, you know? I never did comedy before. Well, I should also say that you would, in, in the book, your your goal was the theater. Your goal was the legitimate stage. And you, there's one line in the book where you say, uh, I, I didn't even want to do movies, let alone television. No, no. I, I wanted to go to do the theater in New York on Broadway. And I did go with Jose Ferrer. Yeah, in uh, 1958, you made it to Broadway. Ah, yes. now that brings up a story. Hmm? So, ho <laughs> <laughs> any stories about Jose Ferrer? <laughs> I I was I was crazy about him, but he you had to keep moving. You had to move fast. <laughs> <laughs> especially, fast hands, huh? Especially backstage in the dark, you know, so so it was <laughs> It was nip and tuck. If he ever did catch me, sometimes he'd say, listen, do you think your husband could play tennis on the weekend? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would think, oh, God. But I thought he was swell. I did. Terrific yeah. actor. Oh, my God. Yeah. And a, a presence, a great presence mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the room, you know? Wonderful. And you came back to Broadway, if I have this right, 30 years later to do Arsenic and Old Lace? Because this was 58 that you did the play oh, with Jose I Ferrer. I did. I did with Gene Stapleton. Yes, we've talked wow. about that show. I think yeah. Abe Vigoda was in that cast. Was he? Abe, Abe was in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Abe, I love Abe. Yeah, it was. Oh, it was. And we were on a national tour. That's yes. something I had never ever done ever. How? Not only I'd never been on Broadway, but to be on a national tour, you know, you'd go and you'd spend a month in each big city. Gilbert, guess who was? Guess who else was in that cast? Oh, who? Bill Hickey. Wow. He was in New York, and that's what Abe Vigoda replaced him. Oh, but, okay. But who was on it was Larry Storch. Larry Storch. And he oh, became my Larry Storch was Einstein. He was in the Peter Lorre. My great pal. In fact, I just talked to him last week. Oh, you're friends with Larry. Yes, we he adore lives in him. New York. Yeah, we, yeah. we had and him we on had the a wonderful podcast. Chat. He just had a birthday. I know it. He's just wonderful. He was one of the first people we talked to on this show, Marion, back in really? 2014. Yeah, we adore him. And and oh, I think it was angel. I think it was Larry Storch who was friends with Tony Curtis. He's in Operation Petticoat. Yeah. And and Larry Storch advised Tony Curtis out of being a good friend that he shouldn't try to pursue an acting career. <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> oh, God. Boy, Isn't he the we, best guy? We had the best fun together, honest to God. Yeah. Yeah. Gil Gilbert spoke at Abe's uh, service. Did you? Yeah, he and eulogized in a, I, in a funny I, I, way. It, yeah, his his daughter wanted me to speak, 
and I just kept doing jokes about how old he was and everything. And and <sighs> they, I was, <laughs> I was a big hit at the funeral. Well, you remember the joke about Abe, Marion, was that he had died before so many times. <laughs> so, and and oh. this is funny. This is something you may have in common with Abe. I was looking you up on the internet and there were a bunch, as you always find on the internet. So there were a bunch of websites announcing that you died. Oh, me? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, oh, oh. Right, right are they now, dated? Yeah. Right now, we're talking to the late Marion Ross. <laughs> oh, God. God. Uh, well, was I? What, why? Why did I die? They, I, they, yeah. I don't know, but on the on the internet, uh -huh. uh, every couple of weeks, there's someone who's <laughs> alive and well who they <laughs> announce as being like Eddie Murphy died a couple of years ago. Yeah, you're in good company, <laughs> yeah. Marion. Good. Was I'm, our pal I'm, Tony Roberts in that production too? No. Arsenic and Old Lace? No. No. And he may have. He was probably it in the previous. Before or after. Yeah. Know. Yeah. No, we had Gary Sandy. Oh, Gary Sandy. He yeah. went on the road with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just to work with Storch Gene, and Abe. And, and, I, and Gene and I became so close. Gene Stapleton. Gene Stapleton. Oh. Uh, we're big fans. He became a great, great pal. We're big fans. Yeah. It, well, I've had I, I have, have had a wonderful life, and the fact that I'm I am really retired now. In case there are any casting people, you know, with any big ideas, because sometimes I can't. I'll have to say to somebody, "What is that line? <laughs> what is that? Well, what do I what, say?" I that? see on your IMDb page, you've got you've got productions. There's there's something on there for 2017 and 2018. <laughs> Well, I I went off to do a play in mm -hmm. I, I I go to Kansas City all the time to Overland Park to do plays at the new theater for my friends uh, Richard Carruthers and uh, uh, Dennis Hennessy. So I was in a play with them, and I said, you know, children, I'm tired, and. I don't want to die this way, so I want to quit the play. No, no, no. They said, we'll make it easier. We'll make it easier for you. But I, I quit it. I quit it because, uh, you know, we kind of know. And and it's so interesting is I don't care one bit. I can watch all my uh, contemporaries doing these things, and I think, oh, good for you. <laughs> <For you. laughs> did you see the movie? Did care. you see the movie? Uh, if you're not in the obit, eat breakfast. Did you see Carl Reiner's movie? Marian? No, I didn't. It's, a, no. it's all about nonagenarians. It's all about yeah. people in their 90s, right? like Carl oh. and Mel Brooks and and oh. Norman Lear, who are still going strong. Yeah, but you know we're not quick. We're not quick. It's the the stuff is in there, but sometimes I have to find it. And if if uh, if they if there's a timer going on, I can't. Maybe you know. Can we throw a couple other wild cards at you while we got you? Do, sure. Do you remember making a TV movie with Phil Silvers and Jack Benny? Yes, I do. The slowest gun in the West. I what, do because what here were I was, they like? I was playing. It was a rough set. It was it was all guys. It was a rough set. I'm this fair. <laughs> I'm this fair maiden, and and this is a live you know show, and it's big comics. Whew. So I, I just <laughs> had to hang on, you know. <laughs> And they, so they were funny in real life. Oh, very funny. And, you know, setting each other up all the time. You know, <laughs> very competitive. Very competitive. competitive. All right. What do you want, Blake? I'll show you what I want, Sheriff. I want her. I found you! Well, Sheriff... Well, Sheriff. Gentlemen, remove your hats. You have just witnessed the most beautiful demonstration of true love you'll ever see. True love? Elsie May, Mr. Blake here came in here with so much love in his heart for you, he was willing to face certain death, my guns, just to prove it. I'm engaged to you. You're a lucky girl, Elsie May. I thought you loved me. I do. But compared to him, I got to step aside. You're going to let him get away with it? 
Why, the easiest thing to do would be to gun him down. But I'd rather step aside than be known as the man who snuffed out this great love. <laughs> Mr. Bissell, you're going to regret this to your dying day. Come on. Wait a minute. Don't you speak to me again. Oh. Wait a minute. You worked with so many people. I mean, and your, your your TV work in the 50s and 60s alone, you worked with Robert Vaughn, Ray Milland, Clint Eastwood, Lee Marvin, Barbara Stanwyck, Burt yes. Lahr. Yes, right. And I th think, I don't have a program from that or, or a script. I think R little Ron Howard was in that also. 11th Hour. Wow. Mm. Yes, Ron yeah. Howard. You very young Ron Fair? Howard. Yes. Yeah. And you worked with Clint Eastwood. Yes, on Rawhide. And, you know, I wasn't, he was so, uh, he was so tough on the director. Wow. Interesting. I, I never quite, I never quite got over that. As I think the director could have been gay a little bit. I don't know. I don't know. He just, and I thought, I don't like to see that. I don't like to see that. Oh, that's interesting. Isn't that, isn't it? Did you know William yeah. Shallert, too? He was another an, an actor who was in Some Came Running with you. He, yes, and he was a lovely man. Yeah. Lovely, lo yeah. lovely man. President of the and Screen was, Actors Guild. And he, well, and he was a reviewer for the LA Times. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We, we were yeah. very we close were, to having yeah, him here. Yeah, we almost had him on the podcast. Uh, no, he's a lovely man. But tell Gilbert this, because it's so interesting, too, is how airport, how you took, because that was a turning point in your life. You took a, non, a small non-speaking part in airport that your friends advised you not to take, oh, yes. and, and it led to something very significant. Well, I, I was getting divorced. Nobody had a job. And I, I could see that George Seaton was doing airport, and I'd worked with George Seaton on uh, operate something. Proud right and the away. Profane. and the Proud and the Profane. Yeah. <clears throat> so I went to see him and I said, I'm getting a divorce and I would like a job. Uh, he said, you want a, a part or a long part? I said, a long part, a long part. So they were casting people to be on the airplane and they didn't want to use extras. They wanted real actors because we would have to improvise, a, 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 you know, a catastrophe on the airplane and everything. And I had a characterization written out, but no lines. And I was paid below minimum. And I said, thank you, I will, I will. And it went on for, it went on for five weeks. We had to come every day to be if they called for row something on the airplane, that was yours. And I was spent every day talking to every actor there who needed a job pretty bad for some reason. Mm -hmm. So we would spend the days talking to each other and unloading our griefs. And Sandra Gould was there just because she's, you know, she's just having a good time. Sandra Gould was she, Mrs. Kravitz on Bewitched, right, Gilbert. She, well, Remember her? <laughs> and she didn't need the job, but she's such a fun person. So I got... <laughs> I got to know her really well. So one time she invites me for dinner, and then she also invites Millie Gussie, who is a casting woman. So Millie Gussie and me and Sandra Gould, and we have dinner. And Millie says, you know, you would be really good for this part in this little pilot we're doing. Uh, it's a very simple part. You could, you'd be good for that. So she, she put me up for it, and uh, it was... Happy days, and my my lines were, "Oh, Howard, you're not eating. Oh, Richie, you know, wear your sweater." It was it was this kind of thing. So, so. Uh, but had she, you not taken that role, that 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 non-speaking role, that was humbling. Right. I thought there is a lesson there. I had to step back, step back. My friends and said, "What's the matter with you? Why are you stepping back like that?" Step back so that I could step forward, right? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. The the pilot was called New Family in Town, and, and it, it was, did not star Tom Bosley. It was you and Harold Gould, right? And it was done on Love American style, right? And right. they said it was just uh, it was just turning into the seventies, and they said, you know, the uh, the the sixties are kind of a hot item now. They're going to give you. I'm going to give you a thousand dollars as a hold. And uh, 
And we may get back to this. We may get back to this pilot. So I went down to the Globe Theater. You went back to San Diego because you didn't think anything was going to come of it. No. So I did Summer and Smoke because my good friends at the Globe Theater, Craig said, anytime you come home, anytime you want to, you come home. This is your home. <clears throat> so I called him up and said, well, I see you're doing Summer and Smoke. I could do that. And he said, years later, he said, everybody there looked at one another and thought, I am, Marion is the least the person in the world that you would want to play this Southern, you know, Alma Weinmiller, this Tennessee Williams Southern woman. So I went down. Craig did the part for me. He would, no, no, he would say, he would show me what to do. He would show me how to move. He, he handheld my, me through that thing. And, and, uh, at the end, near the end of the, well, we had just barely opened. We just barely opened. And I got great reviews. Why shouldn't I? I did whatever Craig told me <laughs> to do. You know, he did it. And then somebody came and they said, oh, I see in the paper that that Happy Days pilot sold. I said, where? Show me, show me. My agent said, get out of that play, you know. And I, I had... Barbara Best was my press agent. I had a press agent. And she said, you can do, you can do that play and this part in the, in the pilot. You can do both of these things at the same time. Don't worry about it. You do them both. So for, for a little while, I did both because my lines were so simple on Happy Days. And uh, it was only as the years went on, what, what would happen... We uh, uh, like on the Monday morning we would read the script. You know the whole cast is there and all the all the parts were all there. We would read the script. They'd say, "Marion, read read all those girls and read all those other character parts. Read all those parts." So, <clears throat> oh, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. my heart would go. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. I would <laughs> I would just read. So I would kill <laughs> myself and read these parts. So their heads would flash around and they would say, "Wow, wow!" So they began to write better. And better for me, and my part got better, better all the time. You know, the whole history of Happy Days is so interesting, too, how they passed. We talked about this with Henry. Oh, yeah. They passed on the original pilot, ABC did, New Family in Town. Yeah. But then American Graffiti happened. And Ron was seen in the pilot. Uh, George Lucas saw Ron in, new, in the New Family in Town pilot, cast him in American Graffiti. American Graffiti became a sensation, was nominated for Best Picture. And ABC went. Well, what was that thing? The, the, oh, that that. Yeah. And then they renamed. And then it was. It turned up repurposed as that Love American style installment, Love and the Happy yeah. Days. That's that's the story. Yeah, yeah. And the rest is history. You get a kick out of a Jewish guy from New York playing an Italian, <laughs> an Italian, an Italian tough guy. <laughs> well, <laughs> Gilbert you know, gets a kick I, out of you that. You know when yeah. I did when I did Brooklyn Bridge, uh, here I am playing a Jewish immigrant mother in, in in Brooklyn Bridge. You probably never saw Brooklyn Bridge. Did you ever see Oh, it? yeah. We were good on that show. Sure. I was. We're I, really I was a fan was. of Gary David Goldberg. <laughs> yeah, I loved I loved being on that. <laughs> but uh, how did you, 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 how did you, you, you said you started eating at Cantor's Deli to immerse yourself in Jewish I, things? <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I ran into anybody, any Jewish people, I just, oh, I just, I just <laughs> ate them up, you know? <laughs> yeah. You were worried that your Minnesota roots were going to show through and you weren't well, going to be credible? I just credible was so fascinated. As a... and, and I said, I said to one lady, oh, I wish I were Jewish. She staggered back. She said, she was Jewish. She said, I've never heard anybody say that. <laughs> I would be remiss uh, since we're talking about other TV roles, Mary, and my wife is a, goal, is a, a Gilmore Girls watcher. <gasps> ah. And you, you play such a wonderful villain on that show. The original, and, the original Lorelei. You play, well, even, you, if I may say, that, you play a very convincing shrew. <laughs> even that was interesting. Uh, I, I It was like a, a, the script came, I, I forget the, what, but, but it was this, on a Saturday, I thought, no, I, I, I want to play this part. I want to, I want to play this part. And this was for an older, older part than me even. So I, I called up the studio on a Saturday and I said, is, uh, is this Amy, 
uh, what's her name? Oh, Amy Sherman Palladino. Sherman Palladino. So yeah. I said, is she there? I, I, could I talk to her? So she said, God, no. I said, listen, I, 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 I want to try that part. I bet I could do that part. She, I said, I have to go and do something else for a couple of days, but I could, I could be back. I don't know why I was so assertive, but I, you know, take control of your, control of your own life. Isn't that something? So she said, okay, I'll, okay, I'll send somebody over uh, and to bring a wig and, and we'll do some wardrobe. So she sent a person over on Sunday and even that person said, oh, you're much too young. So then, so anyway, I was playing this old, I was playing the, the mother of Edward Herman, Ed, Ed Herman's mother. <clears throat> I, I loved that part. She was so rude. Yes. She plays this mean spirited <laughs> I, kind I of love, uh, shrew or whatever I love on, Go, on Gilmore being, Girls. And she's very good I at love it. being, being rude. And, yes, after and all those years of being the ideal mother. It must have been such a treat to be this a total bitch. <laughs> it was. It was. But I learned it on Brooklyn Bridge uh, because those Jewish women were tough. Were tough. Yeah, I and would. Uh, Brooklyn Bridge is available. Nice. Uh, it's available on DVD. I would urge our listeners to find I, Brooklyn Bridge. I don't think it is available. It's not? I don't think so. Really? It's very good. I have a set. Okay. So you have Everybody. to you have to come over to my house, you know, or we could go to one of those places and remake some of them. You know, it's probably against the law. <clears throat> he was a he was a brilliant guy, Gary David Goldberg. Oh, was he? Yes. And this and this and I would say to him, I said, I really caught your your grandmother, didn't I? Or was it his mother? I guess. Well, and he said, No. He said, Oh no, she was much much tougher than you. <laughs> I mean, that's Gilbert's actual life experience. That, that's that, right. you, 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 yeah, you, yeah. you were a Jewish guy from Brooklyn growing yeah. up right around the same time that Gary did. Yes. So that's a series I think you would relate to. I got a couple of questions quick, Marion, from our from our fans for you. Uh, a little segment we call Grill the Guest. And Stephen Craig says, Marion worked with some of my favorite character actresses, including Kathleen Freeman uh, and Mary I Wicks. Oh, I did work with Mary Wicks and Kathleen Freeman. This was, these were live television shows. Gertrude Berg show. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Does it, Wonderful. Did, did, it wants to know, do you have any memories of those legendary ladies? I, I do. I, Mary Wicks, I, she would drive me different places. I'd probably pick me up and drove me. And she's quite a character. Absolutely. Here's one other one from Tom. Tom Burbine says, did Marion know Robin Williams would become a star when she first worked with him in my favorite Orkin? The oh, Happy Days episode. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was extraordinary. You know, they wrote in this part and all of a sudden people are coming out of offices, coming down on the soundstage. And it was like, even I could see Ron and Henry dig in their heels, just hang on as tight as they could. Because, Robin, you couldn't keep up with him. You couldn't keep up with him. Oh. Oh. So you geez. knew you knew that this guy was, was he destined was dazzling. for... He was dazzling. Yeah. And, what a, go ahead, and Gil. you said you didn't, unless this is wrong, too, uh, that you didn't get along with Tom Bosley at first. I, I didn't. He was rude to me. Oh, he didn't like me, and he was disappointed that I got the part. He must have wanted somebody else. So um, it was hard on me. So I write about it in the book. because Yeah, yeah you do. You write I, a lot hardly, about it. I've hardly ever been in a place where uh, somebody didn't like me, and uh, it took me years to understand... Uh, so what I did, I got needlepoint, and I tried to stay. I couldn't, I couldn't sit, you know, backstage with everybody telling jokes because he'd get me, get me all the time. So, but gradually, I, you you realized that he was going through a hardship. Now, then, I found out his wife was dying yeah. of oh. most complicated brain cancer, you know, brain tumors. So that that explained it, you know. But that that's a that's a dark p period for me because you don't ever want to say anything about something, and I could see that he was 
he was not nice to me, but he was he was a great guy. And I thought, what is this? How can that guy? And I could see the other guys liked him a lot. I thought, wow, this is uncomfortable situation to be in because I can see that he is a good guy. Isn't it a credit to, a credit to your acting ability that nobody could ever see that? Nobody, nobody that watched the show would ever I, for a minute. I'm bedazzled when I watch it. I think how um, unbelievable and there unbelievable. was there was a clip from an interview where Tom Bosley points you out as as one of his favorite actresses that he's worked. Yeah, I saw the same clip. Oh well. Yeah, I no he and I cannot say what what a wonderful man he was. Then then he married after his wife died and he'd been through such a tough period, such tough period. Uh he fell in love with Patty Carr and she's a beautiful darling girl and as a family we all enveloped her and brought her into our family. So it was good. I love that you brought your son to the set and he got to be in that episode, the Jump the Shark episode. Right. That's fun. He's, he's, <laughs> that's he's a the one who ran down episode. the beach. Yeah, that's classic. <laughs> no, we all brought our kids to be in the show, you know. <laughs> before before we let you go, last... Oh, go wait, ahead, I just remembered because they, there was that famous photo of the cast of Happy Days and amongst them's John Lennon. Oh, John Lennon came to the set. Oh, I know it. And uh, and those other English guys, oh, I can't think of their name. The, like the Beatles guys, you know, well, that's John Lennon. Yeah. What? I don't know. But uh, it was always wonderful because we had wonderful people dropping in to see us all the time. What? What was what was uh, the last thing we want to ask you? What were Al Molinaro and Pat Morita like? Uh, well, the, the, in, in the script, it would just say, uh, Al does his thing. <laughs> <laughs> just, just cut him loose. Cut him loose. And, and the same thing, the same thing with Pat Morita. They would just have a situation and then just and then just leave him alone for a while. And they would just vamp and make up stuff. And we all just worked around it. He stayed with Gary because Gary had him on the odd couple all those years. I, yes, Absolutely. Yeah. Love lovely man. So smart and such a good businessman and such oh god he was we we all had such a good time. Pat would go on some of our baseball trips with us. Pat Marita. Al, Al not so much. Al not so much. <laughs> Pat Marita was a stand up comic. Oh, I remember day. that. Yeah. Yeah. The hip as, nip he called as it. As well as well as an Academy Award winner. Pat Marita. Pat Marita. He win the didn't he won the Academy Award? Did he? Uh, for, or, for Karate Kid? Well, look oh, I up. think he was nominated. Yeah. Well, that's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah. I love, lastly, I, I love what you said about Gary, too, uh, just in summing up, Marion, that you said he was somebody who made people's dreams come true. Oh, he was. He, oh, God. And, and one time he came to my dressing room, he said, that line isn't working for you, is it? And no, that, that line isn't working for you. I'll fix it. Instead of, and me, I'm trying to think, what can I do? He took the same line, he turned it inside out, boom, 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 got all the beats in there. You know, he had a wonderful comedic sense. Magic touch. Yep, magic yeah. touch. I'm sorry we never got him on this show. That was oh, a real loss. Yeah. And he was Italian, so another reason for me to love him. Yes, he was <laughs> Italian. And everyone thought he was a Jew. Everybody thought he was Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. So, Mary, I've, had, you, I've had such a good time. I've had such a good time with you boys. We're going to plug your book. <laughs> okay. okay. Gilbert's going to give the big plug. We hope we get to see you when you're in New York. I hope I haven't told all of the book away. No, there's plenty in there. <laughs> I've, I've got six cards here I didn't even get to. <laughs> well, is it too late to do the cards? No, well, I, I don't want to give away everything else in the book. One, okay, last, one last thing a fan named Scott Stite writes in, and he says, I don't have any questions. I just have a loving thank you to Mrs. C for being America's favorite mom. Oh, oh, I <laughs> thank you so much. You make my day, darling. Thank you. <laughs> well, the book is... My Days, Happy and Otherwise, by Marion Ross. It's very sweet, Marion. I have to say, too, the, the just the part of how, as a kid, you wrote in your diary 
that you was it, you called it your secret wish that you did. I was telling Gilbert and Dara that you didn't want to share with anybody. You were too shy to share it. Your secret wish to become an actress, and you kept that diary so many years. Yes, and you refer <laughs> back to the diary when you're writing the book, which is astounding. I know. And well, and what a happy journey. Yes, I'm 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 very grateful for it. Yeah. Well, you're a treasure. We thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this has been Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. And if I had any great achievement today, it was hearing Marion Ross say fuck on the air. <laughs> <laughs> this is C. <laughs> And, and, and now you have to watch Gilbert's movie, right? <laughs> I will. I'll, I'll look at it maybe tonight, huh? You promise? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Marion. This was a wonderful treat for us. Thanks to Harlan, too. Thanks to Harlan Ball for setting this up. Thank you. We appreciate Thank it, Harlan. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.